Yeah, so welcome to this talk. So uh, this is Okesh, another uncreative name. Uh, so this is, I'm Mark, and this is a joint work with some, re I work at the Ethereum Foundation as a researcher in the cryptography team. And this is a joint work with two researchers from the Aarhus University in Denmark, uh, Adam Bletchley Hansen and Jasper Booth Nielsen. And um, as a disclaimer, so this is going to tackle a very complicated problem and going to provide a somewhat non-trivial solution uh, or partial solution. So like if you think there are details missing, then that's because in this talk they are because the talk is only 20 minutes long. Um, okay, so, you know, <laughs> short recall, what is a blockchain? So again, on a very, very high level, so I have this blockchain, which is like a huge amount of data and I have a client, and the client can kind of like post and uh, receive money on this blockchain, and uh, oh. and uh, because if a lot of people do this, then that's really a lot of data, so like, you know, keeping track of the full ledger really requires you to kind of like keep track of hundreds of gigabytes of data, and um, if you're, let's say, an average user, and you kind of like, you know, you don't necessarily want to be a full node, but you still want to use the features that the blockchain provides, to you, then maybe you don't, you know, want to keep track of hundreds of gigabytes of data for that. So um, there are solutions for this. So these are light clients. So there are various designs for it. But like the general gist of it is that like rather than storing all of the data that I would need to keep track uh, of everything in the blockchain, I will instead kind of like talk to a full node. The full node will provide me with the stuff that I need, and um, then I kind of like communicate with the blockchain through this full node. Um, so these kind of designs somewhat inherently have what will be kind of the problem in, that we'll get to is that like um, the client, what the client does, the full node will see because kind of like it acts through the full node. So like the client lose, if it wants some privacy, it naively loses it towards the full node. Um, so a separate thing that you might want is, you know, anonymous payments, that's MoneroCon. So, um, by default, in like classical blockchains or like cryptocurrencies, you know, you post transactions, everybody sees everything uh, that is happening. You might not want to have that. You want to have some kind of transaction privacy. Um, so on a very high level, you want to say, okay, uh, when I pay someone, I, you should, like by observing the blockchain, by observing what I do, you shouldn't be able to tell who I paid. Um, and there are different solutions to this. There's Zcash, there's Monero, there's others. Um, and they all provide very much different anonymity guarantees. So, you know, we have kind of like these two desires or design goals. We would like to have support for light clients. We want to have anonymous payments. Ideally, we would actually like to have both, okay? So this is the question that this talk deals with. And again, kind of like on a very high level, really the challenge is that like when we say we want to have anonymity, we don't just mean anonymity against like a, some outside adversary, but we want to have anonymity even uh, for, towards the full node through which we interact with the blockchain, okay? So we want to have anonymity in like a complete sense. And um, one can ask naturally, like, you know, I can look at existing approaches uh, that provide me with anonymous payment systems, and I can ask, can I make light clients for them? And um, again, on a very high level, the problem is that if you look at, for example, Zcash, and they do something called, let's, one can call an accumulator-based approach, then if you want to spend a coin, so transactions are basically coins there, and if you want to spend such a coin, then, um, you need to compute a sort of a proof, but computing this proof requires you to kind of like compute it over the full state, more or less. So this means that uh, if you're a light client, you don't really want to do this, but somebody has to do it, so you could ask a full node to do it for you, but then you, know, then you run into this problem that the full node knows what you want to see. And if you want to kind of like get around this, you could use things like private information retrieval, but this would so, like incur a humongous amount of work on the full node, so uh, this is not really a practical solution. Uh, to this problem. So then there is a ring signature based approach like Monero. And uh, while Monero certainly provides like a non-trivial amount of privacy, um, there has been a bunch of recent works and they like kind of like studied the kind of like from a graph perspective, the anonymity that Monero provides. And it's not necessarily clear like how much anonymity you get. So like you get, clearly you get some anonymity, but how much is very much an open question. Um, so it's currently not too well understood, I would say, is fair to say. Um, so kind of like what is the kind of like goal of this work, what, or what was the goal of this work, is was to kind of like take a step back and ask, you know, like I have these two 
design goals. I would like to have light clients, anonymous payments. Can I build a cryptocurrency or like, you know, like schematically build one that supports those things nicely, so like really provides support for light clients, but also provides kind of like the strongest anonymity you could hope for. Okay, so this is what OCash does. This is not like a practically implemented thing. This is a very long paper with a bunch of different things. So uh, in this talk, I'm gonna um, explain kind of what it does, but apart from explaining OCash, I also wanna highlight like a few of the kind of like objects that we constructed along the way, because maybe you don't agree with the full design, but the objects itself may still be interesting to you. So as I said, this OCash basically will give you full anonymity in the sense that uh, when I perform a payment, you have no idea who I paid, and when the person collects the payment, nobody can tell which payment was collected. Not even the person who did the payment can see that. And um, it supports light clients, and looking ahead, one thing that like, might be controversial to some people is that it will kind of like rely on a committee-based approach, so this means that like, it works for blockchains where consensus is driven forward by selecting committees that perform actions. So if you're opposed to this type of consensus, then that's not for you. Um, okay, so there are several things that like, tools that we construct along the way, and I'm like, not gonna go into the details, but I think on a very high level, maybe you can guess why they could be useful. So one thing is that like, throughout kind of like, the lifetime of this blockchain, there will need to be a randomness beacon, and this randomness beacon will output random values, and they will help you do things. Now, if you're a light client, you kind of like want to, when you want to do something, you want to interact with the blockchain as little as possible. So you might even not want to read all the randomness beacon outputs. So maybe it outputs a lot of them, you don't want to read them. So what we show is that you can construct a beacon that outputs small values, and whenever the next value is about to appear, it's gonna be looking random to you, it's like unpredictable, so it kind of like satisfies the idea of what a randomness beacon should be. But it also has the nice feature that um, if you have the last beacon value, you can recompute all the previous random outputs that have appeared so far. So now if you want to kind of like store all of the values, you just store a short digest instead of storing the full list of values. So a light client, for example, if it might need a previous uh, value, it will just read the last value and from there compute backwards the one that it needed. So this is uh, one thing. Um, one thing that we also think is nice is that um, Another problem that, might you are, that you might run into when you try to combine kind of like light clients and anonymous payments is that you would like to prevent double spending. So I'm a light client, I receive a payment, uh, I would now somehow would like to be able to check um, that this is not a, like a double spending attempt. And what we show is that you can do this in a fashion which more or less doesn't require the receiver of the payment to look at the blockchain at all. It just needs to keep track of the payments that it received from that specific payer. Um, and lastly, um, we kind of like suggest, uh, let's call it an anonymous coin-friendly encryption. So um, as like, you know, coins get into uh, like on this like ledger, like I'll explain how it works on, on a high level in a moment, um, these will be kind of like encrypted values and then as the blockchain grows, they will move around, they will be re-randomized and then, you know, you will prove stuff about them like this is well formed, this contains that value when I collect a payment and so on and so forth. And uh, if you try to do this naively, then usually uh, to prove that something is like an encryption is well formed, you will prove this is a well formed encryption under this public key. But uh, if you want to make an anonymous payment, then like ideally you don't want to reveal under what public key something is encrypted, you just want to say, this is a well-formed ciphertext. So like we kind of like suggest how you can get all of the things that we think you need, where you basically prove this is a well-formed ciphertext under some public key which I'm not telling you. And then when somebody decrypts it, you can say, well, this ciphertext, I'm not telling you under what public key it was encrypted or what decryption key I use, but this is the message that's in there. So. Uh, you kind of like detach the public key uh, identification possibility from like the ciphertext statements that you want to prove. Um, okay, so I'm gonna provide a very high level overview, basically skipping over 99% of the details, but here we go. So blockchain is back. Um, so the way the system works on a high level is it will work by um, Alice, will not perform a transaction directly to pay Bob, but instead Alice will pay a dollar to be allowed to put a coin on the blockchain. 
And then um, later, Bob will be able to um, somehow go to the blockchain and say, hey, that's my coin, and we'll collect it. And now, if we want to have anonymity, then we basically mean that uh, we would like to hide the recipient of the coin when Alice puts the coin on the blockchain. And when Bob collects it, we would like to hide what coin Bob collected. So even Alice should not be able to tell that that coin that she put on the blockchain was collected. Okay. Um, okay. So what is the coin in the system? So the coin will be a ciphertext uh, which is encrypted under the recipient's public key. So Alice encrypts uh, something under Bob's public key, and that will be the coin. And uh, what it encrypts is something that is a transaction ID. But um, this transaction ID will be somewhat special because like, if you look at it from the outside and you have, you're neither Alice nor Bob, it will just look like a random bit string to you. But if you're Alice and Bob, then you will actually know that this is like a highly structured string that contains information. So for those who are like a little bit familiar with cryptography, the transaction ID will basically be a commitment to a bunch of values. And this will later on help Alice to prove that like some, that the coin is well formed in some sense uh, because the committed values in there are well formed. And when Bob collects the coin, Bob will be able to prove that he's allowed to collect the coin, that it wasn't collected before. Again, because it has some secret structure that uh, they know. Um, oh, we went far. Yeah, so, and um, I will not explain too much detail, but like basically this transaction ID is the thing that will allow Bob to detect double spending. So there will be something in the transaction ID where Bob can look at it and be like, hey, I didn't see that yet, so uh, this must be the first time this coin is being used to pay me specifically. Okay. So the other thing, uh, and this is where we get into the territory of things that might be less known to this audience, is um, Oblivious RAM. So um, what is Oblivious RAM? So forget about blockchains for a second and just think you have Alice and you have an array, like a, a memory array, okay? And now Alice can perform operations on the array cell, so Alice can say, hey, read the entry four, and then she receives back the value. Then she can say, hey, write some value into entry seven, and then that happens. Now, uh, you could consider a setting where there's an adversary that observes this old procedure, okay? So it sees what is Alice doing on this memory array. And you could say, well, I want to hide this information. So one thing that you can do is you can say, okay, I encrypt the array, uh, so now Alice will have a decryption key, and now kind of like she will receive and send encrypted entries, so this is just an encrypted array. But um, if the adversary looks at the access pattern, so like what things is Alice touching, then this is actually not good enough because just the um, access pattern itself can leak information about um, what Alice is doing. You can think of it as like Alice continuously reading the first entry is clearly distinguishable from uh, Alice reading different entries. Uh, so just encrypting values doesn't hide all the information you might want to hide. Um, but there is something that kind of like does that, so that hides even uh, the information that the access pattern leaks, and that's um, called ORAM, or, which is like short for oblivious RAM. And uh, you can think of it as like a data structure uh, that represents an array, but now when uh, the adversary looks at the read and write requests on the data structure, it cannot tell which cells Alice is reading or writing to, it has no clue. And just to give you an intuition of like how you could do this, you can think of a very inefficient way of doing it by just like linear scanning the array every time you perform an operation. Okay, so you want to read the first entry, you will just like scan the whole array, and that's it. Like the adverse, we will see you scan the whole array, uh, so it clearly doesn't know what you did, but you did receive the one entry that you wanted to look at. The problem with the solution is that, you know, you don't want to read the whole array if you just want to access one array cell. So that's highly inefficient. So ORAM basically tells you you can kind of have both. It can be efficient and provide this level of privacy. Um, and the way it works is basically by performing a few little shuffles every time you touch elements. So when I look at like, if I want to read position four in my array, then this will be mapped to like some position seven in my ORAM data structure. I will read that. I will also read some dummy values. And then I will kind of like mingle them a little bit and write them back. But I will still mostly not, like only touch a very small part of the overall data structure. And uh, it turns out that this little bit of shuffling around the elements kind of like completely hides all the information. And in particular, if you have like an array of n, of length n, then uh, to, achieve, to get this security guarantee, you 
kind of like you don't need to read just one array cell, but you still need to read exponentially less array cells than doing a full linear scan. So like you need to read a little bit, but not too much, hopefully. Um, so polylog is like logarithm to some constant, okay? Um, okay, so um, what is the high level idea of like this um, design that we propose? It's more or less as follows. So again, Alice would like to put a coin, Bob would like to get out the coin. Now, uh, our blockchain will not just be a ledger where we append transactions, but instead it will be this ORAM data structure. And um, what will happen now is when Alice wants to pay Bob, it will place an encrypted transaction ID, which is like this format that we have, it will place it into this ORAM data structure. And uh, when Bob wants to kind of collect the payment, uh, it will just tell which location in the ORAM data structures it reads. Because um, uh, here it's maybe helpful to compare it to like, uh, let's say, Zcash designs. Okay, if you like take a toy accumulator-based design, you need to kind of like co compute the accumulator over all the existing entries, because if you don't look at an entry, you know that's not uh, the coin that is being collected, roughly speaking. But because now ORAM always shuffles elements around a little bit, Bob doesn't need to hide the entries that it looks at. It just says, I look at this entry and like five more, and I prove to you that one of those ciphertexts contains my coin. And um, even though this is a very small fraction of the overall data on the blockchain, by the guarantees of the oblivious RAM data structure, you still have no clue what was accessed uh, by Bob. Uh, like you get anonymity among all the coins in the system. Um, okay, so this is... <laughs> a wild oversimplification of a lot of things. Um, I just want to kind of like outline like the challenges that this approach kind of like encounters. So the first one is that like, you know, this like array thing that I described is not exactly what we need because we don't really need just a memory array where I put my transactions. It's more like I put coins, later I receive coins. It's a little bit different from an array, but like, you know, if you know the tricks from this ORAM literature, you can kind of like massage them to give you what you want. Um, the other thing is, you know, this ORAM, I said is like, you know, it does a little bit of shuffling operation. So upon every operation, a little bit of it needs to be moved around. And this is where this committee-based approach uh, comes into. So like if you have a blockchain where consensus is driven forward by a committee, then this committee can take care of this task. And this task is, again, only touching a very small uh, amount of the overall memory that it has to deal with per operation. Um, and uh, then the other thing is, you know, I have this array, I keep shuffling around elements, but then later on you're supposed to be like, hey, in one of those five cells, there's my coin. So one question is like, how do you know where to look for your coin? And uh, this is kind of like where this randomness beacon will come into play. So when I, Alice performs the payment, the randomness beacon will publish a value. Alice will be like, aha, I know where my coin went. And then it will tell this value to Bob. Much later on, Bob, or like even Alice will say, I paid you at this time. Uh, later, Bob can like use the randomness beacon to recompute that value. This value will somehow magically reveal where in the shuffled memory to look, and it will look up the coin there. Um, this is a wild oversimplification of all of the parts, but uh, I welcome you to uh, read the paper, which is online, and uh, as you go in the back, it becomes very technical, but like the first 10 pages should give you a very, very high-level overview of how everything works. Yep, um, thank you for your time, and this is the link to the paper. <laughs>